Okay, and uh, thank you, Evan, too, for that. So, um, all right, so dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy, or DDP, uh, I'll be calling it uh, during this workshop, uh, has been kind of a stealth treatment. It's kind of been under the radar. It's not really in the um, consciousness yet of major organizations uh, for the most part. It's, um, part of that is that it's the newest treatment for borderline personality disorder, and there are a number of other evidence-based treatments for it. But uh, I started um, writing the manual and the process of testing the treatment just 12 years ago. So really not that long, and um, uh, quite a bit of research has been done since then, and we've incorporated some of the newest neuroscience uh, findings into, into the treatment. Uh, it does build on other treatments, so you will see some similarities with some of the other treatments out there, and also has some uh, unique aspects. Uh, but one thing that kept us going is that our findings, our, our outcomes, I should say, have been really, really good. And so we have seen lives transformed, and um, it's been very, a very, very, very sick patients, and so it's been very rewarding treatment um, on that. Uh, I've been um, curious, you know, as um, people have signed up for this workshop, uh, really there's been a lot more interest from clinics than private practitioners. And uh, here in this audience, we have representatives from Cayuga County Mental Health Center, uh, uh, no chairing for each of these, Auburn Memorial Hospital, St. Joe's, Hutchings, the VA, Brownell, and, um, and Upstate, of course. So that makes up the, the bulk of the audience. And um, there, may, there may be a reason for that, too. Uh, unlike every other treatment for borderline personality disorder, this treatment was actually developed in a clinic, in an upstate's clinic, rather than a research laboratory or rather than in a private practice setting. So it was really developed for more treatment refractory, really difficult to treat um, patients with borderline personality disorder or those with chronic suicide and co-occurring substance use disorders. So really a very, very challenging group of, um, of clients. So um, you'll notice the auditorium is fairly large, and I wanted to thank um, Dr. Mark Catalani and Colleen Sawyer for the use of this space. We picked this auditorium because there's lots of space for breakout groups. And um, so each of you was given, one of the pages you were given was uh, your breakout group, I think. So you'll see um, uh, the other members of the group in there, and you'll see the location for the breakout groups, which is a little later this morning. So those, that will happen um, at 10.45 to 11.30. So there'll be one group here on the stage, one in the back of the auditorium, one in the mirror room here, and then two in the education and training building. So Dr. Mustad and I will be leading those groups over there and hopefully not get lost on the way. So um, we, we realize uh, also that this workshop represents a considerable investment for you of, um, of uh, time especially and also money. Um, and we have two goals, two things we'd like you to get out of this potentially. Uh, one is we want uh, this to be uh, a workshop where you can learn some things, uh, techniques, some key concepts that you can put in your pocket right away, have it be a tool, tools for you that you can go out and start using them and start applying to whatever your usual practice is. Uh, and then um, some of you are interested in going on to more advanced competency using a more pure DDP technique and becoming uh, competent in that, in that. And this workshop will serve as foundation for um, uh, going to that next level. So uh, as, we, uh, as we go along in the workshop, today will be um, uh, Dr. Evan Duranya will be talking along with myself. And um, we're going to start off with an overview 
And then some of the techniques that are um, a little bit more straightforward to apply and will feel a little bit more familiar to you, perhaps. And then uh, tomorrow we'll be going into a little bit, digging a little bit deeper and going into some of the more challenging but very important aspects of um, treatment and hopefully we'll all get there together. So, uh, um, so just to uh, wrap up, there's, uh, we have no financial disclosures. Uh, I would encourage your cell phones to either be turned off or to vibrate and, um, and then we can um, get started. So any questions up to this point in terms of the format? As we go along, feel free to ask questions or um, I'd like this to be as interactive as possible and I think once you're in the small groups you'll have more opportunity for that too. So we're going to start off with an overview and then take a little break and go into uh, one of the very important sets of techniques. So just want to talk about borderline personality disorder for a little bit. What um, people have found who have trained in this approach is that many, much of what you learn will be applicable not only to borderline personality disorder, but to many other conditions as well. But this was really developed for borderline personality disorder. So just want to highlight some things about this. Um, uh, this is actually a very prevalent disorder, about 6% lifetime prevalence, according to the most recent study. Uh, many people, as they grow older, though, um, kind of grow out of it in a way. They no longer meet criteria. So the point prevalence for the entire population is only um, one to one and a half percent, but it, a lot of people go through it, especially in young adulthood, and meet criteria then. And those people who grow out of it may no longer meet criteria, but they still have a lot of dysfunction. This is also especially common disorder in mental health settings, 10% uh, outpatients, and actually in many of the clinics we've seen higher rates than that, 20% of uh, inpatients. Uh, very often goes unrecognized. We um, tend not to make the diagnosis because of stigma and because we can't bill for it, but, uh, but it's actually very common. And the same kind of prevalence rates in uh, detox and rehab settings. One, an another reason it's maybe often missed is because it so often co-occurs with Axis I disorders. In fact, it always co-occurs in, in my experience. So. In fact, 80% will have both a de depressive disorder as well as an anxiety disorder. Uh, PTSD, panic disorder are all very common. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder can occur in 25%. Uh, but the usual algorithms that we go through, the usual kind of treatments that we use for the Axis I disorders uh, tend not to be very effective. So for instance, you see people usually on multiple antidepressant trials, nothing's really, nothing's really working. Um, psychotherapy for depression very often doesn't work very well. Uh, and then uh, very interestingly, and this is two longitudinal studies that had the same finding, that improvement in the axis one disorders, let's say you treat the depression, that really doesn't affect the borderline personality disorder, even if the depression gets better. But if you improve the borderline personality disorder, the axis one conditions improve. So uh, what this indicates to me is that the underlying borderline personality disorder should really be the main target of treatment because the axis one conditions will improve uh, when you treat the underlying, um, the underlying cause. This slide just illustrates sometimes we um, we kind of minimize the importance of borderline personality disorder, uh, partly because of the bu buttons that uh, are pushed when we're treating them. But this slide just illustrates, this is uh, uh, GAF scores, and you can see that the degree of dysfunction, social and occupational dysfunction, suicidality in borderline personality disorder is actually uh, more than major depressive disorder. 
So there's a lot of dysfunction. Many people have to go on disability. And it's a, um, there's a high mortality risk associated with it. Not only suicide attempts, but also completions. In the most long-term studies going 30 years out, up to 10% of individuals with this disorder do eventually complete suicide. So it's a, it's a very serious disorder. Uh, these surprisingly are relatively ineffective. Um, standard psychodynamic psychotherapy, whatever that is, but um, psychodynamic psychotherapy as it's usually practiced in the community, tends not to be very effective. Uh, there have been trials comparing that to dialectal behavior therapy and showing dialectal behavior therapy is actually more effective. Uh, standard CBT is actually not very effective. Um, there was a trial in England, uh, Davidson did, um, uh, Kate Davidson did a trial comparing standard CBT to a very minimal kind of approach, uh, minimal kind of treatment, almost no treatment. And the CBT uh, showed very little, little difference um, from the minimal treatment. Uh, unstructured supportive psychotherapy, um, which uh, we often do kind of be supportive and so on, uh, does not uh, tend to be effective uh, and then, um, or relatively ineffective. Any kind of treatment can be helpful, but relatively ineffective. And then medications alone um, are also relatively ineffective. So there have been a number of many, many different medication trials. Many of them show some difference with placebo, but the, the effect size is very small. So you don't see a major change. It kind of can take the edge off things. And so uh, medications can be a helpful adjunct, but it's not, it's not going to change the course of the disorder. There are a number of evidence-based treatments, which means uh, in randomized controlled trials, they've shown to be more effective than other kinds of treatment. Uh, dialectal behavior therapy is by far the best studied of the treatments and has consistently been shown to be better than um, um, unstructured kind of treatments. Uh, psychonamic, there are uh, three different psychonamic uh, treatments that have been developed. Uh, dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy is what we'll be talking about today. You can see there's a fairly extensive literature. Some of this is on the website. Um, I listed the website up there. Not all of these are on the website yet, but there have been um, a number of theoretical papers as well as a number of uh, empirical studies supporting it, uh, enough so that um, the federal agency, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, uh, Services Administration, uh, included, uh, decided to include it last year on its list of evidence-based programs and practices. And if you want a nice summary of the treatment, you could go to the SAMHSA website. And to get on this website too, there have to be independent reviewers. Actually, they are outside the mental health field, just purely looking at the evidence and saying, okay, this is actually substantial enough evidence to put it on this list of evidence-based programs and practices. And in fact, uh, it was rated as higher than 70% of the treatments that are already on the website in terms of the quality of the research. So what does the research indicate? Uh, that this treatment is effective across a broad range of symptoms, including symptoms of the core symptoms of borderline personality disorder do get better. Uh, depression, depression is actually one of our most sensitive indicators that uh, patients who have struggled with severe depression their whole life and suicidality, you know, come out of it and feel like this enormous release from their depression. And that's, that's been one of the transforming aspects. Um, also, um, alcohol and drug use. This is the best studied of the treatments in populations who have a lot of comorbidity with alcohol and drug use disorders. Surprisingly, that's been kind of a neglected area of research for all the treatments. Um, and then uh, utilization also uh, decreases. And I'm not going to go into depth in the re into the research. I'll just throw up a few slides just to give you a feel, a more intuitive feel for the data, those of you who like data. Um, 
So this study was done in a population who had co-occurring alcohol use disorders. So all of them had both alcoholism and borderline personality disorder and tends to be a very tough population to treat. This is actually the only study in the literature that looked at that specifically at that population. And um, so, as you can see, um, it was uh, DDP, which was the, um, the purple, was compared to um, uh, uh, optimized community care. So by that we meant we wanted to uh, not just give the minimal treatment like most other studies do, because ethically we wanted them to be in the best possible treatment that we could find for them, given their willingness to engage in that, given their, given their insurance limitations and all that. So we really tried to optimize their care. And so both had about equal levels of treatment. But as you can see, um, it was a 12-month um, study and then we had a naturalistic follow-up uh, at 30 months so treatment ended and then we saw that at 30 months as you can see um, there's a significant difference here um, the uh, DDP group was almost abstinent of alcohol compared to the uh, optimized community care the OCC and uh, this difference held um, during the naturalistic follow-up period Use of recreational drugs was even more dramatic. It was actually a surprise to us, too. But you can see the uh, 12 months, this study population was entirely abstinent of recreational drugs. And that continued at 30 months. Uh, strongly significant difference. Surprisingly, the optimized, this was actually a big surprise to me when I looked at the data, the optimized community care group actually went up in terms of the amount of recreational drugs it was using over time. This was particularly surprising since half of, the, half of that group were actually in drug and alcohol rehab programs during the course of the, course of the study. So you can see a big difference there. Is this by self-report? This is by self-report. So ideally, we'd want to do drug testing as well. Uh, and that's why uh, we didn't even, um, in our initial 12-month analysis, we didn't even look at this because uh, we really weren't expecting any difference. And, and uh, we were using, of course, a validated way of assessing it. It was uh, through a structured interview called the Addiction Severity Index, um, so, which is considered a valid way. But it would be good to double check uh, using. Um, oh, I should also say that. Um, uh, this wasn't reporting to the therapist either. This was an independent research assistant who did the interviews, so there'd be no reason for them to say, oh, I'm getting better uh, to please the therapist, because it was done independently of the therapist using a validated structured interview. Oops. Uh, depression severity uh, also improved dramatically. Um, and you can see compared to the optimized community care, which basically the depression didn't change much, there was a steady decline in depression scores for the 12 months of treatment. And what I was particularly gratified at is during the naturalistic period, depression continued to decline, which means something fundamentally changed during those 12 months of treatment that put people on a trajectory of recovery. So a question, if you apply this approach, a question that will come up with your clients and that you want to have in your head is, well, OK, what, are the ch what, are, what is the likelihood of getting better with treatment? Um, what, what can I tell them? you know, uh, about the treatment and about how effective it is. And um, so what this is, we looked at people who had completed the full 12 months of treatment and asked, uh, well, how many got significantly better? And there's a well-validated, this is 25% improvement in a certain score. So we use that well-validated cutoff. And it turns out that 90% uh, of those 
who stuck it out for a year of treatment actually improved. So compared to roughly 40% of the optimized community care group, and this was statistically significant, of course, extremely important clinically as well. So that is something you can tell your clients. You know, if you go through a course of treatment, DDP, you have actually a 90% chance of getting significantly better. That doesn't mean completely better, but significantly better. Yes, two thirds. Two yeah, which is um, roughly the same as other treatments in the literature. Uh, in fact, it's almost right in the middle. There's some less, some more. But given that this has a co-occurring addiction, um, uh, that tends to have much higher dropout rates. And compared to other studies that have looked at clients who had co-occurring addictions, these are 67% is actually considered a very high retention rate. So, so, um, so we then um, we then looked just um, more recently. Uh, you know, we just looked at clients that we saw at Upstate in a more naturalistic way, and we looked at 68 consecutive clients and. Uh, wondered how about with those clients in the real world setting, the clinics that you guys are doing every day, how many improve? And amazingly, we found an identical number, a 90% improvement for that and 40% for the optimized community care. So it's, it was remarkable to me how the numbers were exactly the same. And our retention rate was, again, the uh, two-thirds retention. Um, now we also at our clinic provide comprehensive dialectical behavior therapy and so we also looked at that and uh, we had an identical rate of improvement for the first six months but then they did split up and so two-thirds of the patients with DBT uh, had achieved significant improvement who completed a full year of treatment um, so it did very well and better than the optimized community care uh, but uh, in this particular population did not do as well as the DDP. So in a nutshell, uh, this treatment um, has a little bit different mechanism of action than other treatments. So we're not, uh, for instance, teaching them skills. We're not giving them great insights necessarily, um, although there's a component of each of those. But really the central philosophy is helping clients connect to themselves and their experiences and to connect to others in more genuine, authentic ways. Uh, it is a manual based and the manual is on PDF. It's free up on the website. So it's easy to access and roughly every six months I'll update it and um, modify it. So having a web-based manual is very helpful that way to stay up to date. Uh, it involves weekly individual sessions. Um, so we don't meet twice a week or every other week, um, but we found we've experimented a little bit with different frequencies and we found that weekly tends to be uh, most effective. And uh, very unusually, actually this is pretty unusual, we have a preset duration. So we tell them up front that this is a 12 month treatment so that there's a beginning and middle and end and clients can prepare for that. We found there are a number of advantages to that and we found that it, it actually accelerates the course of recovery to have a, a uh, preset duration. Things can get pretty dicey of course at, at the end as you might expect. Um, and um, about half, a after the 12 months, about half of our clients will uh, actually go on and leave the mental health system pretty much altogether. About another half uh, will have, um, will go to a more maintenance treatment uh, that can either be relatively short or relatively long on a monthly basis to check in and provide support. It turns into a little bit more of a supportive therapy at that point too. And then every once in a while, we have clients who need 
a uh, need to go back to kind of get a bolus, and so we may get them a six month of weekly again. Um, but we found that formula actually seems to work pretty well. Um, so in theory, there are two core mechanisms of borderline personality disorder according to this treatment. Um, one is what we call an embedded sense of badness. So different from low self-esteem. In fact, these clients can appear grandiose at times, but beneath the grandiosity is this inherent sense of being evil or defective. Um, and then secondly, this gets into the more neuroscience, the way they process their emotions and their interpersonal experiences is a strange way. It actually, they, it travels through different parts of the brain. So this is uh, something the neuroscience is showing. Um, I thought I'd illustrate the embedded badness and how, how that might evolve for some of the clients through trauma. Um, I'll just read it. My suicide attempt was impulsive. My parents had rule over us, and when you're young, you can't see that you can make your own future. And it felt like I must be bad because no one would treat anyone like this if they weren't. I wasn't mad at them at the time. I felt so much guilt, so much guilt, because I was their struggle. Most of all, I just can't stand being a burden to them. When I did the overdose, I just did it without thinking. I know people's reactions to you isn't evidence that you're bad, which makes sense, but when you have that experience your whole life, it's really hard to retrain yourself. So this is a transcript of someone partway through treatment, um, able to recognize her sense of badness, uh, but still struggling with that whole issue around her parents and whether she's justified in, in being upset with them. So this embedded badness uh, is really the main contributor to um, this, um, when they're in touch with their badness, they can get extremely depressed. Uh, very, in fact, some of the most depressed patients I've seen have been those with borderline personality disorder. Um, can get very, very suicidal. Um, there's also a phenomenon that Dr. Mustada will be talking much more about called splitting. And uh, this has been in the literature way before dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy. But essentially, uh, a way to think about it and the way it was originally formulated is that it's a way of splitting off the badness. It's a way of um, putting it aside and um, maybe instead getting grandiose or maybe putting that badness on, um, on someone else. So they're the bad person. They can get kind of paranoid um, or they can be uh, totally bad themselves and then idealize someone else. And, and finally, this embedded badness leads to a kind of false self. And um, uh, I have some powerful videos about that, which I am not going to share today, but um, it's something that, um, this feeling of uh, actually a chameleon, um, someone who molds themselves to the expectations of the other person because they know if they were ever authentic, if they were ever to really share um, what's going on inside them, uh, they would be rejected or abandoned. And so, and I've actually have not met a single individual borderline personality disorder who did not have that kind of false self um, aspect to them. So, um, any questions about this before I move on to the neuroscience aspect and treatment implications of that. All right, so, um, so this, is a, um, this is a overview here where you have um, certain impulses entering the in interior insula and then, um, and then uh, there are two pathways that these emotions and they're not really emotions at this point, but they're impulses from stressful situations. They can either, either be, um, they can either be uh, processed through the limbic system, which is a really primitive part of the brain, or they can be um, processed through the cerebral cortex where they can be verbalized and catabolized and um, symbolized, all the eyes. Uh, whoops. 
Um, so I, I won't show many pictures of the brain, I promise, but uh, I had to show at least one of them. And this just illustrates the different, um, the higher regions of the brain which tend to be impaired in borderline personality disorder. In fact, you see some uh, actually atrophy of these ones with the green arrows, and um, as well as um, uh, not as reactive uh, and uh, an emotional stimulus is going on and they're put in the fMRI, you don't see them light up as much as, as uh, healthy controls. Instead, you see that the amygdala and ventral striatum uh, light up, and we'll talk briefly about the implications of that. The amygdala has been, uh, you see that on, in animal studies, that's what animals do. Uh, lab animals, mice, it's part of, uh, amygdala is part of the panic system, kind of this fight or flight response. And the ventral stratum is what's a seeking system. So pleasure seeking and attachment seeking is both through the ventral stratum. So what do these functions do? This is my favorite part of the brain. It's just a really interesting uh, part. And um, so this, this medial prefrontal cortex is involved in putting our experiences into language along with other parts of the brain. It's a very complex task, how to start describing and labeling one's emotions and experiences. Um, and uh, very interestingly, this area of the brain has been linked to um, a lot of our higher functions that make us more human. So things like consciousness and self-awareness, uh, moral judgment, uh, empathy, and uh, this is a higher level empathy, not just feeling someone's pain, but able to reflect on that and know that it's not your pain. Theory of mind or mentalization where you're able to put yourself uh, in another person's shoes, kind of understand their motivations, uh, what's driving this person, rather than just putting our own stuff on someone and making assumptions, and all of us do that to some extent, but really understanding where the other person's coming from. And self-other differentiation, uh, what's my feelings, what's the other person's feelings, um, all that is part of this area of the brain that's deactivated in borderline personality disorder. Uh, also happens to be, there's a series of elegant studies on this, and which I, I really love that they actually study this, but it's deactivated in romantic love. And so that expression, love is blind, uh, it's, it's actually really true. We all become borderlines uh, when we're in love. <laughs> so, um, so some consequences, a lack of reflective space. Uh, I also use the word alterity for this. Alterity is an ancient Greek term. It's in the philosophical literature uh, referring to otherness. So what it means is that we have a reference point outside of ourselves. We can get out of, out of ourselves a bit and able to look at ourselves more objectively and also look at others more objectively. So it's like having a ship, right? So a ship uh, traveling an ocean, okay, it knows it's a ship, right? Everyone knows a ship. But how does it know where it's going, where it's heading, uh, where it is in the rest of the world? It needs some outside reference point, right? It needs a star, it needs a compass. And so that's how I look at a lot of the medial prefrontal functions, is an outside reference point. So, um, uh, but what you see with this lack of reflective space is rapid shifts in emotion, uh, impaired empathy, um, indiscriminate distrust, not knowing kind of when to trust, when not to. And then um, um, poor uh, episodic memory and difficult labeling emotions. And we're going to spend a lot of time on that because that's something that you can help them with and actually improve their functioning relatively quickly. Um, the hippocampus is involved in that area. And so by episodic memory, it means the ability to recount a specific episode that they had with another person, a specific interaction. And they have, it turns out they have a lot of difficulty with that. Uh, in general, people who have been traumatized have a lot of difficulty with that. Um, and instead, what you see are over, over general memories. Um, you see an attachment pattern that's uh, what's called disorganized. So instead of having a single attachment, like secure, anxious, uh, dismissive. What you see is um, a fluctuating pattern, and so that gives us a kind of push-pull quality to their relationships, and you think you know how someone's going, how someone's relating to you, and all of a sudden they seem like a different person, are relating to you in a totally different way. So that's disorganized attachment. 
And, uh, and then you have a lot of distress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of activation of amygdala, a lot of reactivity. So, <clears throat> so those are some of the consequences of not having adequate prefrontal and hippocampal functioning. The consequences of having this limbic activation, this region really firing up with emotional stimuli. Yeah, we talked about how the amygdala mediates um, what Pengsep and animal uh, studies have called the panic system. Um, it's triggered especially through separation distress. So you can think of your patients having separation distress. It's actually the amygdala firing, uh, creating a lot of anxiety and irritability and frank panic symptoms. Um, the ventral striatum, which is activated at the same time, um, is uh, what we call the seeking system. So they're looking for impulsive pleasure, whether it's drinking, whether it's impulsive shopping, risk gambling, uh, uh, promiscuity, a lot of different impulsive um, pleasures that they may seek. Uh, or attachment, uh, surprisingly, is through the same system. The brain doesn't know the difference between a hug and a drug. Um, and, uh, and what impulsive pleasure or attachment does is it, it actually dampens the amygdala activity. There's a negative feedback loop. So this is how they cope. The impulsive pleasure or attachment seeking is how they cope with stress. And um, it's a limbic solution to emotions. They're not able to know what emotions are experiencing. They'll talk about, oh, I just feel stressed. I just feel anxious. I just feel overwhelmed and they're not able to label, well, I'm actually angry here or sad or guilty. Instead, it's just this nonspecific stress activation. So cutting, cutting in this case would, would help calm you then, impulsively cutting yourself or harming yourself. Yeah, now you'll notice I kind of avoided the topic of cutting because it's actually a really complex phenomenon and really interesting. I think there's a lot of uh, kind of symbolic aspects of cutting. There's also, for some clients, some pleasurable aspects. And um, <clears throat> we um, actually, uh, Dr. Massad and I did a, did a study of adolescent cutters. So I won't get too much into the cutting. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great question and a really interesting area. So. So what we are trying to do here is really work on both those aspects of borderline personality disorder. So we're actually trying to remediate, remediate their brains. So get them functioning in a more normal patterns. So we're trying to activate those higher level centers, the prefrontal areas, and so that their emotion pathways start going through there rather than through the amygdala. And, um, and it's actually possible to do that. And there have been a number of studies showing that psychotherapy actually does reroute things in the brain. It, it rewires our brains. And that's been shown with numerous uh, disorders, numerous kinds of treatment. Um, so we can, uh, we, can, we can do that. So we'll focus on the first two techniques today. Um, in the manual, they're labeled as association, attribution, alterity, ideal, alterity, real. But association techniques involve sequencing emotional experiences. So helping them to put their experiences into a he said, she said kind of sequence, helping them to label their emotions, um, and then um, uh, kind of build a narrative of their experiences. And then um, try to break open the meaning, try to uh, come up with different kinds of uh, uh, possible meanings, exploring different attributions to their experiences. Um, but those build on the narrative. So it's a narrative first, then you, then you explore the meaning. Um, and then um, <clears throat> the relational aspects, these are some of the more unique aspects, especially the alterity real, where we're trying to promote individuated relatedness and um, both through the attribution techniques and through the experiential techniques, that's where people start to heal, start to um, heal from their embedded sense of badness. As they connect with themselves, there's a mourning process and, 
and as they connect and as they see people who they really are and see themselves as they really are, there's a lot of painful adjustment involved in that, but also work a gradual work towards self acceptance and healing. Um, and part of that's what I call an individuated relatedness, where they can actually be authentic with you in the client therapist relationship. And we'll be spending a great deal of time on that tomorrow. We'll, we'll go over it a little bit today, though, too. This was a study we looked at, well, how, how effective are these interventions? And overall here, without looking at the numbers, it turned out that there was a very strong correlation between adherence to this treatment and outcome. The more adherent the therapist was to the methods of the treatment, the better their outcomes for their clients. Um, so that was heartening. Uh, it would actually, because uh, there have been 30 other studies in the literature, and uh, this had a stronger correlation between adherence and outcome than any other treatment, including CBT or other psychodynamic treatments, which average, actually averaged zero correlation between adherence and outcome. So there's something about these techniques which are actually very powerful and very specific and actually do help the clients. So, um, and just highlighting here, the higher the number, the stronger the correlation, and um, 0.3 is a, is a fairly strong correlation. And you can see for the C techniques, the association interventions, um, those were the most helpful for core borderline symptoms, as well as extremely strong. This is very, very unusual in a psychotherapy study to see a, a, an association of 0.79. It means for people who have a lot of dissociation, those C techniques, the association techniques, are actually really, really helpful. Um, the alliance is also really helpful for borderline symptoms as well as alcohol, um, and, and you, can see, um, you can see others. Here the individuated relatedness, that how you're doing that in the therapy relationship. Actually, really, if, they, if you can do that in your relationship, it allows them to do that in other relationships too. So again, there's a very strong correlation between the application of those techniques that we'll talk about tomorrow and, um, and the development of improved social relationships. So what makes, of course, this treatment so difficult and the reason why you're all here is um, these, these are really challenging clients. It's challenging to stay in a therapeutic frame with them. They really push our buttons very, very strongly in many different kinds of ways. And the way they push their bu our buttons, of course, is the way they push everyone's buttons. They're caught, the way I look at it is they're caught in this kind of, if any of you do canoeing or streams, uh, you know, you, you might notice that you get to um, a certain point and may get caught in an eddy where you're not flowing downstream anymore, but you're just kind of going around in circles, a self-perpetuating kind of circle, this eddy. And um, that's how I look at this uh, group of patients. It's not that it's rewarding for them to be pushing our buttons, um, but uh, what it is is it, it's self-reinforcing. It, the way they push our buttons really reinforce their own uh, self-image. And we're going to be talking a great deal more about that tomorrow. But it's very hard not to fall into that. So. Some uh, client with some clients, uh, we may our buttons may f be pushed to feel very empowered and connected, um, and this urge to parent. But the reinforcing part of that, of course, is that it keeps that the more we parent, the more the client becomes a helpless child, and so it reinforces their self-image as being a helpless child. Uh, other clients, we may feel really demeaned and irritated by them and uh, wanting to invalidate them. And, and we call this the angry victim state. And that's driven by actually humiliation and shame. And so we want to give them a shaming response. That's what they drive us to, an invalidating shaming response. And yet that reinforces their self-image. So we are, they're pushing our buttons to really mirror their own image. Um, 
and we'll talk some more about guilty perpetrator state and uh, where we become the helpless rescuer and feeling very helpless and inadequate with them and really strongly have this urge to intervene. But the more interventions we do, the more defeated we feel because nothing works. And then um, demigod perpetrator state is more antisocial traits. We may be either intimidated or charmed and wanting to appease. And the more we do that, the more it re um, reinforces their image of being powerfully bad. Um, so so this, is, this, is, this is why the population is very challenging to treat. So uh, this is just an overview. You know, you don't, don't worry if you're not following all this. But um, uh, so the question becomes, you know, is it possible so this is a deconstructive experience, a unique aspect of the treatment. Is it possible for us to act in a different way from what our patients or clients expect? Or are we just vending machines where they push our buttons and out pops the expected response? So that's, uh, but if we are able to do that, if we're actually able to give the unexpected deconstructive response, we may find that it shatters the image and all of a sudden they have a new perspective on themselves and on other relationships. Um, Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher, said, uh, an opportunity for the self to appear other than itself so that it can interrogate and reflect upon itself in an original manner. So there are four, four stages of treatment. Um, and um, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on the stages, uh, but uh, we'll do especially those stage one, kind of especially at the end, kind of how to get started, what are the tools, and um, but uh, it does involve a treatment contract, involves a lot of um, explanations or framing, uh, often reframing for the client in terms of what's going to help get them better. It's really not finding the magic bullet for you, the right pill or potion. It's, it's going to be the hard work of treatment. It uh, involves really putting yourself in the person's shoes, being empathic, being supportive. Um, and uh, it's not, you're not cold with this technique. And it's applying then specific techniques like the C techniques and trying to develop autonomous motivation. So you're really trying to foster an adult role with your clients. Uh, a sense of ownership of the treatment, that this is really what they want to do. Um, uh, it's a very difficult treatment, and it's also important you know, to develop, um, develop a soothing relationship with them so that they do feel comforted when they come. And if you do all that, uh, the distress level will actually fall pretty dramatically. I'm just going to check on, see how we're doing with time. Looks like we're running out. I'll try to wrap up here. Um, stage two, uh, the central thematic question is, do I have a right to be angry? So these are issues of justification that come up. Uh, it can also be, um, are my needs legitimate? That's another thematic question. It's the other side of the same coin, that issue of justification. And here you use more of the standard um, kind of techniques and what you see um, is a person starts developing a sense if they don't have that already some do some don't they start developing a sense of self a sense of identity um, and there's it, it's amazing actually there's something about emotions and identity their ability to verbalize emotions put their words in their emotions into words actually starts leading to a sense of self um, uh, some of the deconstructive experience can also restore ruptures in the alliance, which inevitably occur. Stage three is a very difficult stage of treatment because it involves, and once you, once you start figuring out, you know, who has responsibility, is it me, is it them, it, you, there's certain realism starts to appear. And realism sounds great. I mean, it sounds great, but um, it's, it cannot be good. Let's say... You know, let's say someone had the fantasy, sustaining fantasy their whole life that, you know, if only, if only I were a better child, if only I'd behave better, my parents would really show me how much they love me. 
and this is pe people coming from really abusive homes, but that was a sustaining fantasy. And so they said, I must be the bad person. My parents are good, they, they really do love me, it's just that I was too bad for them to show their love. So as they come to terms with that and start looking at things more realistically, that's kind of a hard realization to come to terms with. Or I had another client who said, I know if I ever go back to school, I'm just going to ace everything because I, you know, I'm really smart and I know I didn't get good grades in high school, but you know, it's, um, it's just because I wasn't trying, I was too distracted. So she had her first test and flunked her first test. And you know, it, it, so she had this kind of grandiose um, uh, the prot protective mechanism over her badness. And it was a big adjustment she had to make, a big adjustment. So there's, it's a mourning process. There's a lot of ambivalence during this stage. But there's also some, the beginnings of self-acceptance, accepting both one's own limitations and those of others. It's also, oh, empathic capacity, it's also really interesting. Um, I had a patient, for instance, uh, who was in treatment at the time the Twin Towers were being bombed. And uh, she noticed that there are tears on her face. And it really took her by, by surprise. And she said, it's really the first time I've been sad for someone else rather than just myself. So beginning of empathic capacity developing. Uh, stage four can be a pretty rocky time. Um, there are efforts very often to minimize the treatment results and to try to put the therapist in the box of being one more person who's failed them, one more person who's abandoned them. So, but this is a time, it's a tricky time, but it's a time to link the therapy relationship with some other relationship she's had in the past and, or he has had in the past. Um, you see a movement, really it's a continuation from stage three, more realistic uh, appraisals, more individuated relatedness, and kind of a, uh, an unrecognized strength there.